the year 1960, Colonel Stanley Jeffrey, Jeff to his friends, commissioned a wooden yacht to be built at the famous yard of Lou and Halverson in Table Bay, Cape Town. Based on the sturdy tuna fishing boats plying the Southern Ocean at the time. Jeff named her Corsair the Second and she was designed by Kurt Ullman to be a well-found blue water motor sailing yacht capable of single-handed sailing if necessary. Jeff's first round-the-world voyage began in 1964 leaving Cape Town for the Mediterranean and then by the West Indies, Panama and the Pacific route to New Zealand. The voyage was well documented and followed by the sailing press at the time. Corsair II returned safely to Cape Town in 1967 and Jeff was reunited with his wife. Corsair was soon off on another adventure however, when Bill King a famous round-the-world yachtsman called for assistance when he was some 470 nautical miles off Cape Town. Jeff and crew, including his daughter Pat, sailed out to the rescue and by very skilled navigation found Bill and his yacht Galway Blazer, giving them a tow safely to Cape Town for repairs. The tow lasted several days. For many years, Stanley Jeffrey ventured far and wide in Corsair, almost completing another circumnavigation single-handed. Corsair's ocean racing exploits were remarkable, competing in three consecutive annual Rio races from 1971 to 1973. The trophies still grace the saloon to this day. In 1986, Jeff and Rosemary said their goodbyes to Corsair as she was off on a journey to Malta in the Mediterranean, crewed by Jeremy Taylor and Sandra Prinsloo's crew, with their friend and medic, Leon the Skipper. The long passage down the Atlantic took several weeks to complete and was an extremely hard sail for the crew. On the way they visited the islands of St Helena, the Cap Verdes and the Azores on the way to Gibraltar. The calm seas of the Mediterranean were a relief to those newly hardened ocean sailors and on their final arrival into Malta eventually found a berth in Schlemer Harbour. A major page turned in Corsair's book. Following a phone call from Jeremy asking for technical help with a problem aboard, Phil flew out from Bristol following his revered cousin's request with some skilled reinforcements. They monumentally failed in the repair mission, but Tony and Phil fell in love with Corsair and an offer to buy was made to Jeff, which he accepted. Little did they realise the size of the task they'd taken on and the repair job which continued for the next 30 years. Corsair was drawn up the ramp into the old naval dockyard on Manol Island over Christmas and New Year 1986. Phil, Tony, Rog and Fran flew out to spend the festive holiday bottom scraping and anti-fouling ready for the voyage to Bristol, proposed for the springtime. The voyage to Bristol from Manoel Island, Malta, began in May of 1987, and Corsair was crewed in shifts all the way back, with crew changes in Majorca, Villamora and Falmouth. Skippers on the voyage were Roger, Phil and Tony.
the Rock of Gibraltar eventually hove into sight, where we spent a very welcome break. We were lucky enough to have the company of budding yachtsman and famous musician Dave Greenslade on board for the Majorca to Gibraltar passage. I have been grateful for his friendship for almost a lifetime now. The wonderful music from his Roots album had background to this short film for which I am extremely grateful. Again we set sail, passing Cap Trafalgar before reaching Villamora and thence to La Coruña and finally Falmouth. After an intensive year of hard work and expense, Corsair 2, now renamed Cape Corsair to allow for Lloyd's registration, was relaunched in Bristol Docks. Cape Corsair sails via Lisbon, then passes through the Straits of Gibraltar, continuing up the coast of Spain to the Mar Menor into a quiet marina on this inland sea, where she waits for a very important guest. Connie van Rietuten was our illustrious visitor. He was the only person to have skippered and won the Whitbread Round the World race twice, once in 1978 and again in 1982. He was a friend of Rosemary, Jeff's widow, and he took a special interest in Corsair. Are you just east of Yes, just we're, we're there.
Corsair had other lovely guests for that week as well. Sandra and Vanessa joined Rosemary for this leisurely and often gastronomic cruise as we sailed from restaurant to restaurant. <laughs> Connie kept us on our sailing toes and with his careful guidance we got the best speech from Corsair we possibly could. Here she is at eight and a half knots, well heeled. Here we are, sailing up to the rock yet again in 1990, on passage to Dartmouth in the UK. We stopped off in Gibraltar for fuel and a bit of R&R on a quiet pontoon next to the runway before crashing through the straits on a blustery morning. We passed Cap Trafalgar and spent the next few days motoring through headwinds and sailing across Biscay with sometimes uncomfortable seas. Dartmouth Harbour and the Royal Castle was a blessing on the horizon as we passed the Brest Peninsula, but we finally sailed into Kings Weir, where a further chapter in Corsair's busy life began. Eventually, we were allocated a berth on the Kingsway commercial pontoons by the Dartmouth Harbour Master. This happy situation lasted for almost 20 years. It made a fine base for Corsair's further adventures. sailed to the Channel Islands and St Marlow countless times, to Bristol for a festival of the sea in 1996 and another festival in Brest in 1998, followed by St Nazaire Classic Yacht Festival in 2003. La Rochelle and Belle Isle were favourite destinations down the Brittany coast so much so that Roche Bernard became our base for a couple of years absence from Dartmouth. She was a regular visitor to many ports on both the French and English sides of the channel for all those many, many years. Then there was the never ending repair job and the number of glorious days spent ashore on chocks in Galpton Marina Quarry, sleeping aboard 
of dining at the local Manor Inn pub. Hours and hours, days and days, weeks and weeks. Unforgettable times in such wonderful surroundings. Tony's health began to fade in 2016 and the sad decision was made that Corsair should be sold. She needed a good home in capable hands. Unfortunately, John Knott, a master craftsman with a long history of wooden boat building, happened to be looking for a retirement project. He made an offer and sailed her off to Ipswich to start work. Yeah. So, good on oh, uh, this this boat needed me more than I needed this boat. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And he knew that. Yeah. And uh, the thing is, and I say to him, I say, well, I say, I'm the only person who could do this. There aren't a rich man on this planet who can do this. No. Because if you take us put in a boatyard, stuff it. Yeah, yeah. What a hell of a, I mean, he's taking it back to basics, isn't he? Yeah. Well, this, this is the idea is. So here she sits between Halberg Rassi and Oyster Yachts, an ageing wooden queen amongst fibreglass debutantes of the day. John Knott is a master of wooden construction, but his advancing years are a reminder that with time flying, he could do with some help and enthusiasm from somewhere. There must be someone out in the yachting community that would like to see a genuine Lou and Halverson catch from the 1960s restored and sailing again in her true glory and get in touch. Cape Corsair is a truly classic yacht of her time. It would be a great shame to let this glorious piece of sailing history fade away in the corner of a boatyard somewhere.